Hi again. So the next speaker is uh, Torsten Reitz. He is a founder and CEO of uh, WeTransform. He's contributed to several open startups, especially related to OGC, and uh, build and manage products like uh, Ale Studio and uh, Ale Connect. And uh, it's about them that uh, he's going to present us. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation to the session. Um, I hope you can hear me well and everything's working. Yeah, perfect. Great. Thank you very much then. Well, let's get started. Yeah. So my presentation this year is on the one hand about a piece of open source software known as Hale Studio, um, but also about what we can actually do with that that actually has an impact. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about yeah, basically what current climate change means for the forests, at least in Central Europe, um, and what challenges there are if you actually want to support solving that problem, looking at the data, processing it, um, whether the work that has already been done in Europe, like building up Inspire and other infrastructures helps with that, and how tools like Health Studio can specifically support that process and then in the end help resolve the, the challenges around ch uh, climate adaptation for forests. Yeah, so let's get started. Maybe just very briefly. Um, yeah, I'm with a company called WeTransform. Uh, we are based in Darmstadt, Germany as a spin-off of the uh, Fraunhofer um, Society. Our goal is really to build up Green Deal um, data ecosystems. So uh, basically make environmental data really useful and usable. And um, that means that in the past, we've mostly focused on the implementation of yeah, European or national uh, directives and laws around environmental and spatial data. Um, but we're also working towards really making this data uh, yeah, a useful and, and valuable resource in all kinds of applications. We have two main pieces of software that we are developing and providing. One has been around for more than 10 years now. That's Hale Studio. That's going to be the focus point. Uh, of this presentation. The other one is called Hale Connect, which is more like a cloud uh, data platform. Yeah, so let's get started. Um, yeah, for those of you who don't know so much about the situation, uh, currently it looks like this, that many, many tree stands in Central Europe, but also in other places around the world, um, yeah, suffer a lot from basically changes that come mostly from uh, the climate change that we can observe. So for example, there are extended periods of droughts, um, there are other types of um, pollution that weaken the trees, and then there are new pests and, and other pathogens that affect trees. And this means that a large part of the tree stands that we currently have, for example, in Germany, are really at risk, basically, of dying very quickly. And that, of course, means that there is less capability to capture CO2, and even a lot of CO2 might be released. And of course, there's also a loss of biodiversity and other factors. And this is only going to continue. So what we see now in 2020 is like the start. But this year, this is for 2080. It's a map of the state of Baden-Württemberg in Germany. And basically any red color means that the tree stands in these places are unlikely to still have conditions by the end of this century that they can continue to live. You can see only some, some very small areas here in the higher and north uh, aspect slopes in, in the Black Forest actually have a chance of staying a bit like they are right now. And pretty much all other trees are really at danger. And what that means is, is that something has to be done. But yeah, there's always the interesting question, what to do actually? And um, that's basically the domain of decision support. So the question is, can I just do the same thing that I would have done in past years, centuries, whatever? Probably no. The thing is that the changes are really unprecedented compared to the experiences that all the forest experts have basically from the past couple of centuries. And so they really need to look into um, basically what to do now so that within 50 or 80 years, uh, the decisions are actually valid. And that includes decisions like what stands do you actually need to transform most urgently? So where should you basically do something maybe in the next five to 10 years? And where is it okay to wait for another 50? Then for any given spot, for any given stand, which species and varieties within these species and also combinations and development types are best suited for that location. So what you sh should you be planting there? And then is the question, how do you manage the transition? And what objectives do you actually have after the transition? Like 
For example, I know a lot of forest owners for whom biodiversity is really important and they just want to have a nice forest basically. But for others, the social function or a climate function or even an economic one can be very important. So if you want to achieve all of that with a transition that's now coming, of course, you need some support to, to really manage that and plan that. And um, yeah, if we want to implement such decision support and not just for like one particular forest owner, but at scale, then a couple of things are needed, like a, a large pool of harmonized data that really covers, in our case, at least part of Europe, ideally more. And we need powerful analytic models that can make use of the very wide range of different data sets um, and really help in understanding uh, what correlations and so on are there. Um, if I have that decision support, it means that I can make even in a very complex scenario information that is otherwise really only accessible to experts and their intuition to everyone. And that can, especially then, if you make it accessible to everyone, it also becomes important that it's understandable. It's not just, it shouldn't just be yes, no. It should also explain why a particular recommendation is being made to support these decisions. And that's where the whole area of explainable AI basically uh, the ability to understand why a system proposes a certain suggestion or classification or other thing. Like here in this example, uh, it actually shows that the system classified this picture as showing trains, but not because it recognized the trains, but rather because it recognized the tracks. And um, in this way, we can also kind of find out why does the system think that this or that is a good idea. And that means that I, as a person, can then assess basically the proposal because what I can't do is, is wait for the outcome. Yeah, I can't wait 50 or 80 years and then see if the idea was good. I need to understand the idea now. And um, yeah, to build all of that, as mentioned before, this is basically a lot about having a wide range of high quality data. And I, um, just when I saw the presentation before, I thought, ah, oh, yeah, there's a lot of overlap more or less in the challenges. Um, for this particular challenge, we need really up to 30 or 40 different types of data sets. I've just listed some of them here. The red ones are those where there is often insufficient data, actually. Like, for example, a tree inventory that really describes in detail what kind of tree species and tree types are located where and in what state they are. Um, forest types, tree vitality, also on vitality, there's often yeah, not a lot of data available and so on. So there's climate parameters, there's uh, things like the um, digital elevation model and so on, land cover, etc. So there's so many different types of data that are required. And we need to bring all of that together in a somewhat homogeneous way, which is a huge challenge, of course. And if we apply um, that then to forest transformation, we need to use this data to solve several different types of decision support problems from a technical perspective. For example, there's perceptive ones like what is actually the health of my trees? Yeah, I want to recognize vitality in a unified way from remote sensing data, for example. Uh, but ideally, I can also recognize tree species from that. I also need to be able to make predictions. Like I want to say, OK, I see certain developments. So are the trees in that particular stand going to be at risk or not? How will pathogens spread? How is biodiversity developing? So those things are things that I can try to predict. But then. I also need to support the decision-making through cognitive and augmentative models. So for example, finding um, answers to what forest development types are well suited for a location or what method should I actually use for the transformation? Like, can I just basically use uh, natural re rejuvenation like the baseline scenario or do I need to get really active? Yeah, so I have a pretty complex situation with a wide range of data and a wide range of models. And uh, if I actually try to yeah, solve that, <clears throat> I first need to really look at the data and see whether I can make something meaningful from that. If we look at yeah, the typical steps for making data ready for analysis, there's things like gathering data from different sources, different formats, basically yeah, aggregating all the things that I will need. And then there comes the cleaning step. So that means that I typically, for my purpose, need to make sure that I improve the data quality to a degree that my outcoming, that the models that I will use later on have a good quality and good results. Might also have to normalize data. Um, and, yeah, and then continue basically with further steps like refactoring, analyzing the actual properties that I have in there, 
And then for at least for machine learning models or deep learning models, I have the step of feature engineering where I select which properties I'm really going to use. And this might include using derived properties or output from other models. I might have to re-encode and balance and so on. So there's quite a lot of steps that are typically necessary um, in a complex scenario like this to bring the data together and then have a foundation for solving that particular problem. And uh, here is one example that shows, for example, how good elevation can be used to find out what tree species I have in a given data set. So we, we, we kind of expected that elevation is a good one, a good feature. So yeah, we basically continue using that. So if we have a look at what basically we can cover uh, of these individual yeah, steps in, in this data preparation process by looking at standardized data, the data sets that have already been harmonized according to a common shared set of specifications like Inspire. And it's pretty clear that Inspire will help with something like gathering and cleaning the data. Inspire has common uh, standards for how the data needs to be specified. It makes the data accessible through WFS, WMS, et cetera. Um, so it definitely helps with these stages and also to some degree uh, with the refactor work. However, we think that actually far more can be done. So if we have standardized models like that, we can go much closer and actually get the data really ready uh, for basically analysis and for usage in uh, machine learning or deep learning or cognitive knowledge graph-based systems. And um, however, there's typically a few more things that are necessary for that. Yeah, and that's where we basically do make the step to looking at a, couple, at a few particular tools. So maybe just very briefly, um, for those who don't know it, so Hale Studio is basically an ETL tool for structured spatial and environmental data. And you can use it also for, for non-spatial data, uh, but still that's what it was specifically developed for. Um, as such, you can probably best compare it with something like uh, FME from Safe Software. Um, and at least in Europe, it also has quite a bit of usage. So it has somewhere between 50 and 60% um, of, of, of the market, you could say, in, in Europe typically. Um, that being said, uh, what is it really good for? And the, the special thing about Hail Studio is, is, is that it's a declarative uh, software. So you go in and you basically map a source model to a target model by directly relating uh, the elements of each model, data model, uh, with the appropriate functions. And this works even for very, very complex data sets. So be it large relational uh, data sets or models like Inspire or national standards or international ones, which tend to be quite complex. Um, so this, this really works quite well, uh, independent of the complexity. Um, <coughs> sorry. Another thing that's kind of special is, is, is that it has this real-time preview validation um, and also publishing capability. So you can, whenever you make a change to your mapping in Hair Studio, you can pretty much immediately see what the impact of that uh, change that you made is. So it enables a very intuitive and fast way of working uh, with data sets. It's of course open source or so LGPL 3.0. It's also designed as an open platform. So there's a lot of people who use it uh, or use components of it in, in other applications. Um, yeah, and it's it's quite adopted for, let's say, a niche tool like this. Uh, one of the nicest things is, is that people actually share their transformation projects, and there's quite a few of these now. Um, and often this would allow you, if you need to make a transformation, that you don't have to start from scratch, but you can rather look at what other people did. And that's kind of what um, Hail Studio really is today. So Hail Studio is first and foremost an ETL environment with which I standardize, harmonize data sets. It has a lot of tools inbuilt that make that process really simple compared to alternatives, but it's also not fully automated. So it's uh, probably the effort is typically around uh, one third of, of other tools and we're working on automating it further. Um, but yeah, what you typically use it today for is for example, to create Inspire data sets or in other standards. Um, it's also being used a lot currently for environmental reporting, like for example, for the European Noise Directive, um, or for air quality, et cetera. You can also use it for things like database to database migration, or if you have any scenario basically where you need to integrate data from many sources into a harmonized form. And um, yeah, it's also being used, for example, for assessment of migration risks. Like if I want to know whether my existing 
data will fit in a new system or not. That's what you could use it for. Yeah, and it's, uh, last but not least, for sharing and reusing transformation projects. So we even have customers who mostly use the documentation features that you can see a little bit here in the background um, to, to help other people understand what they did in a certain transformation. Yeah, now we do a little bit of a deep dive. So that's basically, like I said, what Hale Studio does today. Um, and what we've been working on for a while now is what we call model transformations. And that's also what's relevant to this whole uh, topic of making data more analysis ready than it is. Basically, the assumption that we're working from is this, that typically in our world, what we have like in Inspire, there is a conceptual model um, expressed, for example, in UML that basically specifies the, the meaning and the structure of the data to some degree. And derived from that are via some formal model transformation rules, there are, uh, there are different logical models that they basically describe how that data should later be encoded. Like if you, for example, use a GML application schema or you use uh, some data, uh, some, some definition language to express a relational model. So you create the, from the conceptual model, the different logical models. And now what we are using is actually that information in these formal rules um, to uh, establish automatically how data would need to be transformed, not just from one encoding. So, I mean, just converting formats is usually easy. Um, and there's a lot of tools that can do that, like a one-to-one -one, uh, format conversion of GML to GeoJSON is not particularly hard to do. Uh, but what this does is apply a full model transformation, even in a quite complex scenario, like going from an Inspire GML, which can be very complex, to something easily useful, like a CSV file or a geo package file. And this transformation that's marked here in red is basically generated in a fully automated way. And it can be adjusted according to whatever information needs to go in. Um, for example, if you know I'm going to process my data for a machine learning environment, you could also already apply transformations that do things like uh, one hot encoding and the like. So basically get the data very quickly because you already know a lot about it into the format uh, and structure that you would need later. And this achieves two things. So the first thing that that achieves is, is that it makes already harmonized data much more useful. And we do already have about 50,000 uh, Inspire harmonized, fully harmonized data sets in Europe. And that's not bad, yeah, it's a good starting point. It's maybe a quarter of what there should be in total, but it's still a, a good state already. And the second thing that we can achieve with that is, is that we can actually simplify data harmonization a lot. Because right now what people really struggle with is, is that they have, for example, the super complex Inspire model, uh, and they need to understand that model and then map whatever they have into that complex structure in which they don't really uh, know a lot about. And what we can do with these model transformations is that we actually create a much simpler model, again, either automatically or with some configuration. Uh, and then people just map to the simple one and the more complex model is automatically derived from that. So there's two things that this really does. First thing is it simplifies data harmonization. And the second one, any data that is already harmonized becomes far more useful in different environments. Yeah, so that's basically what we're working on now. And um, yeah, I just wanted to not leave you hanging and also let you know when what becomes available in Hale Studio. Uh, so right now we're testing the release candidate for 4.1 that doesn't yet have the, the model transformations. Uh, what it does have, however, is uh, things like improved geo package support. We also added uh, a shapefile writer. Yeah, I've always been kind of resistant because we first and foremost support open formats. Um, but yeah, there was significant pressure this time to finally add one. Um, we're also in the migration to Java 11, uh, added quite a few yeah, UX enhancements and things like templates for uh, END, that's a noise directive reporting uh, templates. Um, for the next release that's planned for Q1 next year, uh, we'll have the initial model transformation capability. So my colleagues are working on that in the next two months. And then there's probably the first uh, daily builds that have that. Um, <coughs> that will be non-configurable and it will be focused on the use case to, sim to, to map to a simple model and then uh, automatically derive the complex uh, variant. Um, we're also adding MySQL support and um, yeah, complete the migration to Java 11 according to the plans. 
And then for 4.3, for we'll have uh, basically the full model transformation capability planned. I think largely this is something that will evolve over time. Um, it's yeah something that's supported through various activities, also a Ceph project, just like the uh, Geoharmonizer project that we heard about before. It's also supporting that. And um, yeah, so there's going to be a longer curve with this developing step-by-step. Step. If you would like to get involved, well, you can always, of course, uh, download Hail Studio from GitHub. Um, you can basically tell us, okay, what are you using it for? Uh, you can share your projects, do harmonization with it, whatever you want. Uh, of course, it's also really nice if you actually find something that uh, you would use, uh, get involved with. So we have quite a few people who use it, um, but there's not that many organizations right now who also contribute back to the um, to, to Hail Studio as an open source project. So yeah, here's my call to you. If you're interested, we'd be happy to talk to you to find out what would be important to you. Um, we also do regular networking. So there's user meetings and webinars, usually around once a month. And of course, if you're interested, uh, please reach out and we can also do uh, joint R&D projects, for example, around that. Yeah, that's more or less it from my side. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions then. <coughs> Thanks a lot, Thorsten. Really interesting presentation about uh, transformation of data and uh, also the first step about uh, forest was interesting. So some question from the audience. Is it possible to, just one moment, I put the banner, so. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to convert a GFS schema to an uh, XSD schema with L Studio? Um, not directly. Uh, there is, so Hail Studio can basically read the schemas and it can export schemas in various formats, including um, yeah, an XML uh, schema definition. Yeah, um, I would actually have to try that out, how that looks like. I haven't done that particular uh, conversion yet. Okay, thanks. And uh, the second one is uh, model transformation so mm -hmm. sounds really good, cool and useful, but could you show one simple real life example to make it more concrete? Yes. Yeah, actually, I thought I should do that. Thanks for the comments. <laughs> yeah, so let's do uh, one that I worked on a lot in the last weeks was about um, the European Noise Directive. And uh, there's a new reporting workflow for that from next year on. And uh, what happens there is, is that you basically, on the one hand, you have an extended Inspire model with all the luggage that there is, and then a much simpler model. Um, that's the result of that. Let me just open that. It can take maybe 15 seconds, I hope. <laughs> yeah, maybe you have to share again the screen. Yes, just a moment. Sorry, takes a moment. I clicked on the wrong thing. No we have uh, a couple of minutes. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh man, sorry. Okay, so. So you should see my screen again? Yeah. Okay, so this is, um, I'm going to very briefly start with the documentation. Um, so basically, uh, this is the input model, uh, the data model for, in this case, one of the European Noise Directive of data flows. Uh, so it has a, a lot of complex properties, actually. So things like thematic identifier, geographical name, and so on. Stuff that those of you who know Inspire probably have encountered quite a few times. Um, for others, yeah, it's basically what it leads to is a typically quite a large XML, GML document. And uh, what's done then is, is, is there's actually, in this case, there's a detailed configuration. So this is not automatically generated, but rather with the people who use this, we decided what the best set of model transformation rules to apply would be, which is these. And then there is a resulting relatively simple model. So in this case, it just consists of two tables, um, which are linked in a one-to-one -one fashion. 
And um, compared to the full-blown Inspire model, it's a flat model. Uh, it can easily be put into whatever format like GeoPackage or the like you want. Um, and yeah, in this way, the outcome is just really um, yeah, easier to understand and easier to map to typically. It's also much more compact than all the variants and so on that you could in principle have uh, in the Inspire model. Yeah, and the, the thing is now, if you have, if you map to the simple model, you can then also automatically create uh, again, because it's derived from the same conceptual model as the GML, you can also map back to that, to the, to the GML and automatically transform, not just to this simple model, but again, also to the complex one. Um, to, in this case, the, the source model is based on uh, area management and regulation zones. Okay, thanks. And uh, the last one probably is not really a question, but is a comment. Shouldn't be there a big <laughs> red warning seen popping up in a shapefile that doesn't uh, respect topology? <laughs> <So>. Yeah, <laughs> just a quick note on that. Yeah, like I said, I'm not the biggest fan at all. Uh, and actually when you import shapefiles, half the time there are big red warning signs popping up. Uh, for example, about projection, about encoding, about whatever. So hey, hey Studio will complain to you a lot about shapefiles. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <I mean. laughs> so let's see if there are no other questions. So thanks a lot again and uh, see you around. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Have a nice day or morning or whatever, everybody. And yeah, enjoy the conference. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye. So we will start in a couple of minutes again. See you here.